A car bomb explosion sends two members of the Earth First group to the hospital. And the question tonight is, will the injured environmentalists face criminal charges? Good evening, everyone. This pipe bomb went off at a busy Oakland intersection, and the man and woman who were heard had planned to lead a summer of militant protest against logging practices in Northern California. The unofficial word is the two environmentalists injured when a bomb went off in their car just before noon are suspects and not just victims. The unconfirmed report says Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney will be charged with possession and transportation of explosives. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth here in this matter before us? Yes, I do. State your name for the record, ma'am. Judy Berry. What is the basic event out of which the case arose? On May 24th of 1990, I was bombed and nearly killed in a car bomb assassination attempt. Today, reclining on a couch in a private room instead of testifying on a witness stand. Um, why is that? I have terminal cancer and um, weak and getting weaker. said you were bombed. What exactly happened? I was driving my car, and I was um, driving down the street, and I was following somebody. At a certain point, I think she was getting ready to make a turn, and I was trying to follow her and realized I wasn't going right, and I quickly hit the brake. And at the time when I hit the brake, um, there was a very huge explosion, and I felt it rip through me. The explosion being so powerful, that the sound itself had a force. I was amazed. I mean, I've, I've been in Vietnam, I've seen bombed, ex bombed vehicles, and I was amazed. When I first looked at that car, I couldn't see a driver. What happened next that you can recall? The next thing I remember, I, the car was stopped, and there were people around, and I was in incredible pain that I had never felt before. I knew my back was broken. My legs both were immobile at the time. I knew that my body was ruined. I knew that I was paralyzed. I felt that I was dying. The driver was identified as 40-year-old Judy Berry, also of Ukiah. Both victims are members of the environmental group Earth First. Both were taken to nearby Highland Hospital. The passenger was taken out first. Was someone in the car with you when the explosion occurred? Yes, Daryl Cherney was riding in the passenger seat. Now out in the redwood forest grows trees 2,000 years of age. And the owls they hunt, the bears they home, the salmon swim in the rivers rage. I heard a crack, and then my whole head started to ring. Then I heard somebody scream out, it's a bomb, there was a bomb. And then it all made sense that someone had tried to kill us. Do you remember Daryl saying anything to you while you were still in the car? I remember him saying that he loved me, and I remember him saying that I was going to live. Forget all the mayhem and utter destruction that's tearing my planet in two. And I want to spend the end of the world with you. Well, 
What's the next thing you remember after being taken out of the car? Um, I remember being placed on a gurney, which again was another incredible pain. I remember being put in an ambulance. I remember going to the hospital in the ambulance. I remember repeating that my back was broken. I remember a nurse hugging me and telling me that they were going to put me unconscious. And I remember begging them to let me die. And that's the last thing I remember before I lost consciousness. And what's the next thing that you remember that happened when you woke up? I remember waking up and finding myself completely immobile and my leg up in a traction device. And I remember that there were two uniformed police standing next to me as soon as I opened my eyes. Did the two uniformed officers speak to you? Yes. They told me that I was under arrest and they said they wanted to for transporting explosives, I guess. And what was your response at that time? I said I wouldn't talk to them without a lawyer. Is the police case falling apart? I wish I could see the police case. Uh, my, my feeling is because they didn't file charges today, it certainly is not a strong case. The Oakland Police Department still considers them as suspects in this case, and we have no indication at this point to indicate otherwise. Uh, we have no information to indicate uh, anybody else is involved, and we're still uh, looking at it, uh, them as suspects in the case. I think that they're looking at entirely the wrong places. And I, I don't think that I don't think that they're doing a thorough investigation. I think that the police tactics need to be investigated here. The real fundamental questions are remaining unasked. You know, whose interest is this in to 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 have these two people bombed? Did you have a visit with your parents? Yes, and um, I remember them bringing in a tape recorder and asking me to make a statement on the tape for a newspaper, and I remember attempting to do that in a groggy state. Thank you to all the Earth Firsters and uh, Peace people and Nufa people in general for this tremendous outpouring of concern and support. It really makes me feel better knowing that you all are down there and knowing that I'm not alone and we're not alone. And that's something I've always felt in Earth First, is that we are a movement. I think it's important to first to remember where the real violence is being done. The real violence is being done to the forest, not as much as to the organizers. I hope that this will not deter people from coming this summer to save the Redwood Forest because terrorism is a horrible tactic, and we know that the timber companies will use it. But terrorism cannot stand up to mass nonviolence. At the time of the bombing, what was your occupation? I was organizing for Earth First Redwood Summer. And what was Redwood Summer? Redwood Summer was a campaign that we uh, initiated in 1990 to bring in students and others from around the country to participate in a summer-long exercise of demonstrations, nonviolent civil disobedience. And where were they planned to take place? Various places, Mendocino County and Humboldt County would be the main ones. The three uh, timber companies that own most of the Redwoods were the primary targets, Louisiana Pacific. I think that what we've seen is these corporations have come in here and literally destroyed the ecosystem. Mendocino County is absolutely desperate. You all supervisors flew over Mendocino County Timberlands recently, and I think that you will agree that we're really at a crisis stage. Georgia Pacific. What we're protesting against at Georgia Pacific is forest liquidation. Now, Georgia Pacific is also the largest timber corporation in the world, and they're going to be gone in a couple years. They're beginning to sell the lands around the mills. And Max Am Pacific Lumber. I came to Humboldt County, California, to a town of Garberville. I looked at the newspaper headline and it said, company town to be taken over by corporate raider from Texas. And in this particular case, that they were going to have to increase the cut, as it turns out nearly triple it, to pay off a junk bond debt. It was a company called Max Am, and they took over a pretty old company called Pacific Lumber that had attempted to log sustainably for 118 years. Since he took over Pacific Lumber three and a half years ago, Hurwitz has himself become a target of five federal investigations into his tactics. Pacific Lumber is now cutting trees, 
faster than it's ever cut them before. They're so big and there's so few of them left. It's a crime to cut them. It's a crime against future generations. Enslaved by a way of life propped up by lies. But some of us have come see things through different eyes. Tomorrow there'll be more of us than there are today. We're that ragged, jagged, cutting edge, and we all say it's quitting time. It's quitting time. It's quitting time on that high tech plantation. It's quitting time. It's quitting time on that old. was not their bomb. It was planted there by somebody else, and now it's being blamed on them, because it's easy to blame somebody, somebody who is, who is quote unquote, a radical. But, you know, radical to us just means involved and aware and informed and willing to take chances and take risks. You're not from California, is that correct? No, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland. Did you go to college? University of Maryland. Did you have a major? <laughs> Many. Uh -huh. I had a checkered career. When you joined Earth First, did you have experience in organizing and advocacy? Extensive. My primary organizing experience was in the union movement, both in the retail clerks union when I worked at the grocery store and in the um, American Postal Workers Union at the post office. Well, I was shop steward at both locations and I helped organize and lead strikes at both places. then nobody was ever out here protesting because Palco was cutting them slower than they were growing back, and that's just fine. But Maxam comes out here trying to liquidate the old growth to finance their junk bonds. I'm sorry, that just doesn't make it, and that's why we're here. We're not here because of the loggers. We're here because of Charles Hurwitz, some slime bitter from Texas who's never seen a redwood in his life, makes $4 million a year. That is 10 times what the average mill worker will make in a lifetime. Judy Barry did something that I believe is unparalleled in the history of the environmental movement. She is an Earth First activist who took it upon herself to organize Georgia Pacific sawmill workers into the IWW labor union. Judy and I have discussed um, trying to get together a, a uh, communications forum between environmentalists and loggers. My brother and my dad, they've been working with Earth First and they got a line of communication going. I, I'm an environmentalist and a logger. I'm really happy to see Ernie proposing alternatives because that's exactly what we would like there to happen, that people can still work in the woods without destroying the woods. John Maurer was so sickened by the fast cutting, he quit. I just wish Mr. Hurwitz would go out in the woods and take about a day and just sit down inside the Redwood Grove. Maybe he'd have a different opinion of what's going on to him. Rather than looking at a dollar bill, he'd be seeing a tree for its value. But with the big corporations, it just seems like it's uh, just fight it out in court. It's just like, the hell with it. We're going to do what we want. And this is our game plan. They're ruthless. Well, guess what, friends? Environmentalists and rank-and-file timber workers becoming allies is the most dangerous thing in the world to the timber industry. How did you first get involved with Earth First? I was working as a carpenter making houses out of old growth redwood. So I was watching the trucks go by with the logs on them while I was building these you know, fancy houses out of the wood and the contradiction disturbed me. What was the mission of Earth First at the time you joined up with them? How did they see themselves? That Earth First was an environmental group that used what they called direct action to try to bring attention to and halt destruction of the environment. Here cutting chainsaws, killing the trees.
Earth First got itself started by a few people who were tired of all the compromising by the mainline environmental outfits. It's time for a warrior society to rise up out of the earth and put ourselves in front of the juggernaut of destruction. The major threat to biological diversity is industrial society. You know, everyone has certainly made mistakes, but no one has made mistakes like we're currently making right now. Earth First is convincing good people in mainstream environmental groups not to compromise before the game starts. We aren't left, we aren't right, we aren't in the middle, we aren't even in front or behind. <laughs> we aren't even playing that game. The whole idea of biocentrism, that uh, the natural world is greater than and more important than the small part of it that's uh, the human race. Well, there may be disagreement over tactics, and you hear it said that it's wrong to sabotage equipment and destroy equipment. Isn't it at least equally wrong to sabotage and destroy the environment? We don't have to figure it all out. We don't all have to be pure. We all don't have to be saints on this planet to do something for it. Earth First is not an organization. It doesn't have a president, a vice president, or even a secretary. It doesn't have any officers at all, and no headquarters. No hindquarters. Who's their leader? They don't have a leader. They're all leaders. And there's thousands of them running around loose. Another dire warning about global warming tonight. This one from a respected United Nations scientific report that was a year and a half in the making. This one says that the Earth is already showing a warming trend and industrial pollution must be cut in half just to stabilize the situation. If not, scientists say, we can expect droughts, floods, loss of farmland. Formal charges were filed today against the two Earth First activists injured in yesterday's bombing in Oakland. The other thing that Harry Merlow's not dealing with when he says he owns this land and can do what he wants to is the climate. We all know about the greenhouse effect. We all know what this is doing to our climate. I saw something really dismaying in the Utah Press Democrats just two days ago. It was an advertisement for a new product called a solar prism. It says, heat. Now this here where I live is called Redwood Valley and there's hardly a redwood left in it. And last year it hit 115 on the clear cut where I live. And I know it didn't hit any 115 when there were redwood trees there. So what we're seeing here is a changing of the climate. We're seeing a drying up of the land and we're seeing the greenhouse effect taking in. Besides the kind of demonstrations that you described a minute ago, what other activities did they engage in? The first prolonged campaign up here that I engaged in was at a place called Cotto Wilderness in Laytonville. We're not going to leave and abandon our position. We're pretty determined to shut you guys down. <laughs> it was a Bureau of Land Management land. It had old growth on it. and. Protecting old growth was our really primary mission. No work today for a change. Think so? I don't know. We just set ourselves up in the middle of the road and physically blocked the logging equipment from getting to the place where they were supposed to cut. Forevermore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's sit down. 
you think about this thing here? One page, four thousand and two. And they're so easy to get to if you just know how to drive. And you don't work at How are you today? I'm fine, how are you? Good. Who's in uh, charge of the group here, do you know? Uh, well, there's no one in charge. Every single person here is here on their own. They have their own plans for what they're doing. Uh -huh. So I think your best bet would be to ask um, after the song is over for everybody's attention and address the whole group. Except for the as of this morning, the Cato Indian What's tribe that? says their treaty was broken with the BLM land because the people didn't let them know they were going to start logging up here. And the Indians are going to Sacramento and are going to raise some hell. I guess we're all aware we got a slight problem here, correct? Yeah, they want to log. Yeah. All these trees. <laughs> Just for starters, do you have the extension permit that allows these folks to be doing this road work after October 15th? Okay, take a look at that. Okay, and then immediately on the same day, you gave them permission. There is a problems with the within the framework of, of the system's own rules. So we're not sure that if we let this crew go through that, we're not going to be allowing an uh, unlawful act to be taking place. Okay, everybody's refusing to leave, then, right? Okay, then let's huddle. That's right. <laughs> It looks like a successful Earth First blockade. We're moving pretty slow, about one or two miles an hour here. This is sovereign territory, it is this federal right. U.S. agreements between this nation and the U.S. government. It's two nations. And it has been completely violated. And the violations have been this. It is not about the operations, it is that the territory and the Cotto Nation was not notified that these operations were pending, that this operation had been in procedure for eight years. None of the artifacts, they were not notified, that none of the artifacts were removed. That is complete violation of the treaty agreements with the U.S. government. So you guys plan to work this weekend? No, job shut down. Hmm? Job shut down. Oh, it is? Hmm? Who shut it down? The alarm. Today? Environmentalists are claiming victory for now after all work was stopped on a logging road today in a remote region of northern Mendocino County near Elkhorn Ridge in the Cottle Wilderness area. What happened as a result of you sitting in the road like that? The neighbors formed a neighborhood group and filed a lawsuit, and the place was saved. Were there any other particular protest activities that you were involved in besides the ones you've told us about? Constant from the time that I came. It was a growing organization and growingly active. One large one, for example, in 1989, we had what we called National Tree Set Week. The protests are being held throughout California and in Oregon, Washington State, Montana, Colorado, New Mexico, and Massachusetts. In our area, we held five demonstrations in six days around Mendocino and Humboldt County, sitting in trees and blocking logging trucks during that week. It's been a great week so far. Everybody in the United States knows about this now. I mean, people that never even heard of this stuff are talking about it. We've had tree centers up in seven states. Okay, so we got three women okay. tree sitters up in trees, and we got them up on Sunday night just before dawn. And it was on a horrendous clear cut and swaying in the breeze, uh, you know, cooking hot right near the ocean. You could see seven miles of clear cuts of the ocean. It was a great sight to demonstrate the devastation that's going on in this county. And we rescued the tree sitting equipment, and it's right up the canal. <laughs> Now. The neighbors wrote up a real nice list of demands, things like no logging 
on other people's land. No logging at night. No shooting off guns every 15 minutes. You know, things like that, right? So this was too unreasonable for this logging company, apparently, though. So the first thing they did was start brandishing weapons at us. We continued with our blockade, and we stood up there and played music and being cute and everything. But you can only be cute for so long. And then this one young crazy logger guy gets in his pickup truck and runs our line again. You know, there's like a little bit of pushing and shoving, not that big a deal. Then this same young guy that was driving the truck came out of the back with a crazed look in his eyes and just planted a haymaker right on somebody's face. And then suddenly one of the other brothers, we hear, you fucking commie hippies, we'll kill you all, blam! And he shot off a shotgun in the air. And this is the second time in two months that the police have stood by and let a logger assault an earth person and refused to arrest the person even though there were 20 witnesses. Had there been an incident in which you were hit by a truck? Yes, I was traveling to a well-publicized demonstration as part of National Treats at Week and I had my children in my car and several of my friends, and we were rear-ended by a log truck that we had blockaded the very day before, driven by the same truck, the same driver. Everybody's pretty badly cut and bruised. Daryl is uh, not in the greatest of shape. They had him attached to one of those uh, wooden boards. As they were going through Philo on their way here, and a logging truck didn't slow down coming into town hit him from behind, propelled them into another car. There was no squealing of brakes. There was no warning whatsoever, just simply a violent impact from the truck hitting my car. And um, I, I can only call it attempted murder. Fortunately, no one was on that porch. They would have gotten killed for sure. And they refused to investigate it as anything but a traffic accident. And I think that what was happening was a real pattern of non-enforcement of law in, uh, regarding Earth Firsters. And um, what this did was it gave a green light to anybody who would attack us. You don't stop for the workers' safety. Never fear the worst. Because if somebody kills himself, just blame it on Earth First. So how was the decision made to stage Redwood Summer? We held a meeting and talked about it and people were enthusiastic. So I, the way I like to describe the lack of structure is that things happen by constituency. That if there's a constituency for something to happen, it happened. And people liked the idea of Redwood Summer and agreed to work on it. He said freedom riders for the farthest come. Just like in Mississippi it was done. Your forests are a-falling and the nation's eyes must turn But if you look to Mississippi, there's a lesson you must learn Call the nation's college students forth Just like when the South called up to the North Although we have very broad public support, both locally and nationally, Locally, our towns are under the grip of a stranglehold by these timber corporations. And so just as in Mississippi, they could get away with beating up black kids when no one but Mississippi was watching. With the eyes of the nation on them, uh, it was no longer possible for them to do it. We thought that by making this a national movement that we could stop this insanity. Did you have some particular responsibility then, once it was announced, in helping make it happen? Well, I had no formal responsibility, but as the person with the biggest mouth who was promoting it, I felt a personal responsibility and I assumed an organizing role. You know, it's going to be a hot summer this summer. Timber companies are going to be taking every tree they can before that Forest Forever initiative goes through, and it will go through, and we're going to be out there stopping them. Come join us. I have to be here in this hospital on my back for a total of eight weeks after which I have to begin rehabilitation to try to learn to walk again or whatever I'm going to be able to do. And I'm not going to be able to participate very much in either the organizing or the activities of Redwood Summer. Support two coming tonight from Earth First, uh, from Greenpeace and other environmental action groups. But at the same time, there are harsh words for authorities, especially from the organization known as Seeds for Peace, which provides food and support for Earth First activists. They rent this house and they claim police and FBI agents ransacked the place, virtually tearing it apart. Presumably, they were looking for evidence to link them to the bombing. 
Barry and Cherney had attended a meeting here Wednesday night. Seeds for Peace say the FBI found nothing. Were there discussions of any terms on which Seeds of Peace or any of the other groups agreed to join with Earth First in Redwood Summer? It was all contingent on the nonviolence code. Would you tell us what those conditions were, the terms? The terms were that this was to be a strictly nonviolent, Gandhian style civil disobedience, would include no violence. There will be no verbal violence, there will be no drugs or drinking, there will be no property damage or sabotage. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of college students and others are expected to travel to the North Coast for what they're calling Mississippi Summer. Organizers are asking all participants to take a pledge of nonviolence. Blocking, um, uh, going limp, uh, lying in pathways, that kind of thing, going over boundaries, uh, that is usually not treated as violence. Daryl and Judy are strictly committed to nonviolence. Their whole scene is, is to remain nonviolent and to, to show that we're for uh, life continuing on the planet. Had there been any problems associated with Earth First with respect to any of those things prior to that time? Yes. And what problems had you experienced? When I first got involved in Earth First, Earth First advocated sabotage to logging equipment or other equipment deemed to be destructive to the environment. We cannot let them do this. We've got to put up one hell of a fight with a turn of the wrench and a twist of the screw. We'll apply a little pressure and we'll see what that will do. Yo, yo. And that is our political approach, is one of monkey wrenching, of thwarting it a political Aikido of taking the energy of the mad machine and turning it against itself. Really? Yeah. I've done all kinds of monkey wrenching. Yes. I've taken, a, I've munched roads, I've spiked trees, I've siltated equipment. A couple of us cut down a billboard last summer in Corvallis, got caught for that, fortunately. What I have done is regard to his fellow bunchers is I, every time that one of them burned, I did not make snotty comments about him in the newspaper. And so that is probably a reason why um, he particularly blames me in some way or another. Monkey uh, wrenching uh, is not guerrilla warfare, it's monkey warfare. And in the end, I think people will realize that the terrorists are really the people we have been fighting, the destroyers of the Earth. How did the advocacy affect itself? There's that Earth First Journal in that newspaper advocated sabotage, also tree spiking. What is tree spiking? Tree spiking is driving metal, large metal nails into trees in the hopes of preventing them from being cut. The hope is that timber companies will fear damaging their equipment and so they'll leave the tree standing. Trees that are spiked should have a S painted on them or some such notice and that a notification should be sent to the timber companies. But after a few years it dawned upon me when they built them damn roads and they cut all the trees that I was a fool too blind to see now I'm a tree spiker hath pity on me I've been a tree spiker for many a year I spend all my money on tree spikes and beer I go down to the valley where the tall timber grows. How many I've gotten that nobody knows. <laughs> but if a spike tree made it to the mill, a saw blade hitting a spike could have devastating effects. It cut me right across here and severed one of my jugular veins. There was a general consensus among the logging community that if anybody was caught spiking a tree, uh, they'd just crucify them. It was like um, vigilanteism in its worst. There's a lot of things going on besides what Earth First is doing. They want to demonstrate peacefully, more power to them. But the first guy that comes on my property 
If it damages a piece of our equipment or endangers one of my employees, the ship's going to hit the fan. I'm sorry to say that, but I mean it. As a woodman, I feel, feel that we are becoming the endangered species. What a pathetic situation. The logger is going to have to spend half his time making a living and the other half defending his right to continue to make a living if this Mississippi summer is pulled off. I think you're asking for trouble because they're up here protesting the jobs of the loggers and taking away their livelihood through their protests and taking away the constitutional rights of people. You can't help but bring violence in. Judy Berry and Daryl Cherney, both members of Earth First, are named in this letter from a group called Stompers, allegedly humble county workers in the lumber industry. Quote, if law enforcement fails, our justice will be swift and very real. We know who you are and where you live. If you want to be a martyr, we'll be happy to oblige. Our tolerance of your harassment has ended. The Mendocino County Sheriff told her that they did not have the manpower to investigate the death threats and that if she turned up dead, they would investigate. I was driving my logging truck one day. There was a guy in the road right in my way. I said, hey, buddy, you better get yourself out of there. He said, I ain't gonna let you take them trees. Hey, man, I gotta get to the mill with these. He said, over my dead body. Woo-wee. Hell to the metal, boys. It's okay to be the first one. It'll only get you real fast. It's okay to be the first one. Cause if you join her first, you'll have a blast. Was there a debate inside the Redwood Summer Group about tree spiking? Well, not so much in the Redwood Summer Group. We had all agreed that we were against it, but there was certainly a debate in Earth First. And I felt that it targeted the timber workers with whom we were building alliances. So I felt it undermined our work, and it didn't fall within the moral standards that I thought that we should uphold. Did the local Earth First group take any steps to dissociate itself from tree spiking? Yes, we publicly renounced it. We held two simultaneous press conferences, one in Southern Oregon and one in Northern California. The amount of antagonism that this has engendered among potential allies, among the timber workers, is not worth the few trees that may have been saved by it. So this is the statement that we have agreed to. In response to the concerns of loggers and mill workers, Northern California Earth First organizers are renouncing the tactic of tree spiking in our area. There's been so many death threats. People did go through the original great fear. And Judy, when I first met her, was just coming down from that period of freaking out from the first couple of death threats. Daryl waited a week, but she got through hers, and he freaked out. I think that we call for nonviolence. The timber industry responded by basically saying they'll lynch us if we don't. And if you think I'm exaggerating, this was pinned to my office door. You all may see this also. This is a photograph of me Xerox from a newspaper with a rifle scope over my head. Had you seen that photograph prior to seeing it in that form with the circle drawn over it and the cross? Yes. When did the article appear? On April 3rd, 1993. It was about a Board of Supervisors meeting at which Earth First and currently employed loggers and mill workers appeared together to denounce the timber companies. What's happening is that Louisiana Pacific owns 40 to 50,000 acres in the Comalo area and it's being overcut. And asked for the county to use their power of eminent domain to seize the timber company's properties so that we could assure sustained jobs and trees. My team has worked has helped LP become an extremely profitable company. And what does my team get in return? It gets exported lumber to Mexico, it gets closed mills, unemployment lines, lost homes, broken families, displacement and despair. Stop the liquidation of our forest resources. Thank you. So the idea is that since LP is moving to Mexico, they need to change the name of their company to LPO. Bye. 
Panthers finally got some courage and declared eminent domain. Did it cause you to experience fear? Yes. Did the other items that you've testified about, these uh, 2A and 2B, cause you to experience fear? Yes. The fear does get to you. There's points where y you could almost become immobilized through it. And what helps is to have community. Are the documents that we've been talking about what you refer to as threats? Yes. And did they include the one that begins, Dear Judy, it has come to our attention that you are an Earth First lesbian whose favorite pastime is to eat box lunches in pajamas? Yes. How were you carrying them at the time you were bombed? They were in a folder that was labeled Threats and Fakes. And what were the fakes? There were several fake press releases that were designed to look as if they came from Earth First but in fact were not written by Earth First, that were sent to the press and distributed in our communities. Recently, this widely circulated letter added to the tension here. We know it's a fake. I'm, it's not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of reality. That letter is a fake. No Earth Firster issued that letter. This has been passed around. It it's a, it's a purports to be from Earth First. It says, Mississippi summer come one, come all. We intend to spike trees, monkey wrench, and even resort to violence if necessary. However, it's been distributed in stacks, in the break rooms, in the, in the lumber mills, and there's, it's in the laundromats and logging towns, and it's been sent to the press. What was the response in the press to your communications about the fake press release? The Press Democrat wrote an article in which they characterized it as a true document rather than a false document. You also had occasion to see some documents from the Maxam company? Yes. Maxam sued Daryl Cherney for a protest that he did, and in discovery, he received these documents. It was a series of memos to Charles Hurwitz, CEO of Maxam, Hill and Knowlton, who was the PR farmer. The PR director refers to the fact that Daryl Cherney's name is spelled wrong and so they are not sure of its authenticity. And these documents were sent to the San Francisco Examiner a week after they admitted internally that they believe them to be fake. Directing your attention to the meeting in Berkeley the day before the bombing, at the end of that meeting, what did you do? I, well, people were getting ready to find places to sleep over and a uh, man at the meeting, Dave Chemnitzer, suggested to me that he had a house with a private room that I would be more comfortable in, so I followed him to his house in Oakland. She spent the night before the, the bombing at my house, and we talked, and in fact, they detained me, considering me to be part of some kind of conspiracy. They assumed from the beginning of their interrogation of me that Judy was, was transporting the bomb herself. Do you recall where you parked your car? In front of his house, but one car down. What was in your car when you left it parked that night? There's things that I just keep in my car. Car tools, and also there were some carpentry tools just because I was a carpenter. What things did you take out of the car? My fiddle, my guitar, uh, my satchel with my clothes and things in it, my sleeping bag, boxes with various files and organizing materials in it. What were you doing with a fiddle and a guitar? We were on our way to a concert. I was going to play the fiddle. The guitar was for when Daryl broke his strings, there would be a spare guitar handy. Where was it going to happen? Santa Cruz. Was that a regular thing with you, playing music at the organizing concert? Yes. And together they work as a team. They're very effective using humor and also getting the information out to galvanize people. And they have an incredible effect on crowds. And so we set it up, and um, they were supposed to be there at 4 o'clock. I had talked to her like maybe half an hour before they left, again, 15 minutes before she came. I got contacted that the bomb had gone off. It must have gone off shortly thereafter. They took away my Birkenstock. They took away my car. But when they took my fit away, you know they went too far. The FBI stole my fit away. 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 J. Edgar Hoover stole my fit away. And I want my fit away.
longer groggy and your memories are more orderly. At that time, did you get information about the status of the case? There was a constant flow of people in and out of the room who were giving me information. I learned that I was still under arrest. The decision to arrest uh, was based on the placement of the device in the vehicle, the nature of its construction, uh, physical and other evidence that we developed. When I understand, the police have been very adamant from the very beginning. They say they have no other suspects but this couple. They aren't even looking into that. Linda, are there any other suspects right now? Police say they have no other suspects, and they have categorically uh, eliminated the possibility that anyone else uh, tried to kill Judy Berry and uh, Daryl Cherney. Did you also get newspapers during this period of time? Yes. Were there stories in the paper about your case? Yes. You knew there was a determination pending with respect to whether the case would go ahead. Is that correct? I knew the question was whether or not Daryl and I knew the bomb was in the car. Based on where we've determined the location of the device to be, we believe they should have known it was there. Sources have told us police believe the bomb was being carried in a guitar case that belonged to Judy Berry. You know, their investigation, their whole thing was based on lies from from day one, their initial arrest of me and Daryl was based on a sworn affidavit from that sergeant, Cetera, that said the bomb was in the back seat, therefore they should have seen it, therefore they knew they were carrying it, and they're guilty of transporting explosives. When in fact, the bomb was under the seat. I know it was under the seat. I felt that thing blow up. I know exactly where it was. In the afternoon, they searched a van connected with Cherney in front of an environmentalist co-op in Berkeley, and they called in a bomb squad to remove material from that vehicle. Police won't discuss the evidence, but there are reports they found material to make the bomb, but it may have been only duct tape. The police, though, seem confident. Police say their evidence is compelling, but they would not say what it is. What they found in a search of Daryl Cherney's van late yesterday, or in searches conducted today in the Mendocino-Humboldt County area where the suspects live. What if Do you recall learning that your house had been searched? My ex-husband told me that the FBI and Oakland police had both arrived with the Mendocino County Sheriff and that they had torn the house apart and taken things away and that my children were upset that their room had been taken apart and their toys dismantled and things. Again, focusing on the first few days that you have, that your consciousness is clear and before the court date, can you describe how you felt? I was terrified and I was terrified not just because of the bombing, I was equally terrified that I would be framed for this bombing and spend my children's childhood in prison and not get to raise my children. I learned 
through this experience that extreme fear is a physical phenomenon and not just a mental phenomenon. I would shake uncontrollably and people would try to hold me and calm me down and have a great difficulty doing so. I experienced complete sleeplessness. I could not sleep at all. I would be awake the entire night 100% of the time. It just felt like there was a hole in my stomach. I was so scared. I couldn't focus on, you know, I, I, it's like it, it, it consumed my consciousness, how petrified I was. And, it, and not just, I mean, I didn't know the extent of my physical injuries. I knew that I was in traction and was being told that I would probably spend my life in a wheelchair. But I was, <laughs> in the thought of doing that in prison, was very frightening. Certainly our activism and our struggle to save ancient redwoods up north has left us with many people who uh, are very angry with our successes at slowing down the logging. The 33-year-old Earth First activist was released just over an hour ago on $100,000 bail. It feels terrific to be out and maybe we can all move over to uh, the hospital now and keep the vigil going for Judy Barry. Did you know at that time that the FBI was involved in the case? Absolutely. But even more, I learned that Richard Held was in charge of the San Francisco FBI. I didn't know who he was before that. And I knew that he was making statements in the newspapers about the case. We have to go where the evidence goes. As an investigative agency, we collect whatever evidence is available and take it to the U.S. Attorney's Office to determine if there's a basis for prosecution. Did you learn some alleged facts about Richard Held that you connected to the status of your own case? Yes. I was brought articles detailing Richard Held's career in the FBI, and I learned that he was a COINTELPRO operative under J. Edgar Hoover. The decline in Hoover's reputation began soon after his death in 1972, as the nation began to learn the full extent of his abuse of power, his persecution of Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders, of feminists and the early environmentalists. J. Edgar Hoover described it's a way of they targeting uh, domestic radical groups that they think are, are a threat to the U.S. government. And these are his words to expose, misdirect, isolate, and neutralize political groups that he didn't like. And that's really what's been done to Earth First. They used the term neutralize, but no one ever defined what neutralize meant. You know, someone might think, well, gee, why don't I just have one of my informants in another organization go out and shoot this guy and, you know, have him assassinated. That'll neutralize him for sure. And those things are what made me sure that when, despite my innocence, I could still spend my life in prison because I felt that this man had a track record. Richard Held is the man behind the show. He helped frame Leonard Peltier and jab Geronimo. He falsified the evidence. Life sentences, no bail. It's time to get him freed and let's put Richard Held in jail. The FBI stole my fiddle. The FBI stole my fiddle. The FBI stole Did there come a time when you learned that your house had been searched again? Yes, that the FBI had researched my house. I knew they said that they were looking for nails. I knew they said that they had found matching nails in my house that they claimed matched nails on the bomb. Of course, the nails didn't match either. First, they said that the nails matched a bag of nails in the back of my car. Then they said, well, it doesn't match those nails, but it matches some nails in her house. Well, the nails in my house, they went into my house and pulled nails out of the window trim. I don't think this is normal. I mean, this is not your normal investigation where they're trying to find out who did something. They were just trying to frame me. Then they said, well, the nails match. We can tell in a batch of two to 800. 
finishing nails are not made in batches of two to eight hundred and uh, for them to say that you know as if there's some little old nail maker up there lovingly handcrafting finishing nails in batches of 200. Depending on the size of the nail we could make anywhere from 1200 to 1400 nails a minute and it would take probably three or four or five weeks before the gripper dies would actually wear out where you'd have to replace them and most of those nails within that period of time could be identified as coming from the same machine. Multiply that all out and you're probably getting millions of nails. I knew that this came in the wake of my ex-husband, Mike Sweeney, made a mock-up. He brought this to the press to show that they could show by my injuries that the bomb was under the car seat and not in the back seat. By this time, I was fully aware of those details. Barry's injuries indicate that the bomb was placed directly underneath her, according to the surgeon who treated her at Highland Hospital, Dr. Peter Slaybaugh. And when we proved that, the police responded, okay, you're right, the bomb was under the seat, but the nails match. The search came, I believe, the day after the press conference and subsumed the headlines. One of the headlines said, bomb built at Barry's house, and the contention that I was building bombs in a 600 square foot cabin while my children were sleeping was very upsetting to me. My ex-husband and his girlfriend had moved into my house so that my children could have some stability during this trumpet. <laughs> Excuse me during this traumatic time and for the house that they were living in to be researched when they were just beginning to feel a little bit of stability again was very hard. And when you have two people doing the noble work that was done by these two who were bombed, be attacked, have their lives threatened, almost killed, then we find that we are apparently going to be a accused of self-assassination. As we've seen in the operation of our own government, all sorts of acts that make it almost impossible to believe our government. If they can fund death squads in El Salvador, they can fund death squads in the United States. we'll talk about the letter, which seems to have changed the focus of the investigation. The three-page, single-spaced letter was mailed anonymously to the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. It claims responsibility for placing the bomb in Judy Berry's car. The letter begins, I built with these hands the bomb that I placed in the car of Judy Berry. The letter then goes on to threaten anyone participating in the upcoming Redwood Summer protest by saying, all those who would come to the forest and worship trees like gilded idols have been warned. They have seen the fate that awaits them. It's signed, The Lord's Avenger. It was scary to me, but it also made me feel exonerated. It made me feel like, well, gee, you know, somebody out here confessing, they're not gonna blame me for this bombing anymore. And yet they did. We are extremely hopeful, again, that it will cause the Oakland police and the FBI to look in the direction of finding the culprit and stop looking at Judy and Daryl. Had you seen the press coverage about the Lord's event? Yes. Late today, the FBI admitted it's taking the letter very seriously, although it is not ruled out that it's a prank. The letter does contain specific information with regard to the components of the two explosive devices. In addition to claiming responsibility for the car bomb, the letter writer also provided accurate details matching never disclosed information about a pipe bomb that partially detonated outside a Louisiana Pacific mill in Cloverdale on May 9th. One of the things being searched for in the second search was for typewriter exemplars to compare to the Lord's Avenger letter. So the theory was put forth through that search that I or my close associates had written the Lord's Avenger letter. And what did you hear happen in court? I guess the FBI and the Oakland police together had asked for more time 
to find more evidence, although they still considered Daryl and I the only suspects and the judge had granted them more time and there was another court date set. And of course, officials speculate Earth First could have sent the letter to deflect attention from bombing victim Daryl Cherney. He appeared in court Tuesday after Oakland police arrested him for the bombing, but the district attorney refused to press charges. All we're doing is waiting until we get all of the evidence before us. In the meantime, Cherney is free on a $100,000 bond. He continues to say he is innocent. I believe there were three court dates in all and on the third one, the district attorney declined to prosecute for lack of evidence. Criminal charges will not be filed against Earth First organizers Judy Barry and Daryl Cherney. Flying home from Montana after participating in the annual Earth First encampment, co-defendant Daryl Cherney learned he and Barry would not be charged with transporting the explosives. The district attorney declined today to go on camera to elaborate, but as always, Journey had plenty to say. My opinion is, is that the DA didn't want to go down with the ship that the uh, FBI and the Oakland police were sinking in. Once the district attorney announced that he wasn't going to file charges, did you continue to feel the impact of the charges and the arrest in what was happening in your life? Yes. Although the charges were dropped, we were not exonerated. Although Cherney kept saying he was, quote, exonerated of all the charges, that's not exactly what the prosecutor was saying today. And as for the FBI and its investigation? We ruled no one in, and we ruled no one out. Many frame their faces to symbolize what they say was a frame-up. The duct tape, they said, it's proof positive. The electrical wires, it's proof positive. The nails, it's proof positive. And then when it's time to put up or shut up, the evidence doesn't exist. Oakland police say they're comfortable with the way the case has been handled. And they are still not ruling out Barry and Cherney as suspects. The FBI made a point to say that the only reason that, yes, there wasn't enough evidence to charge us at this time, but we were still considered suspects and that the FBI now, rather than the Oakland police in the lead, was failing to continue the investigation with the assumption that we were still suspects. There's little joy in vindication when there's still a mad bomber on the loose. Barry says police are not serious about finding the real bomber, and that scares her. And that doesn't make it very easy for me to consider returning to my community. I would like to return to my community. I'd like to resume my political activities. And I'm entitled to police protection the same as anybody else. Were you mindful of the effect these accusations against you might have on the political work you were doing? I felt that they not only would, but were discrediting Earth First undermining our call for nonviolence, frightening people away, and creating a tense and dangerous situation on the front lines where some of our adversaries believe that we were now bombers. We'd like to see it happen a different way, okay? And now we're starting to build a little trust with everybody here, and all of a sudden the bomb comes out. This thing's gonna turn into a bigger boil than you can handle, buddy. The whole community's gonna jump at you. It became much of the focus, rather than cutting of the redwoods, it became are these people terrorists? Terrorists is all they are. They uh, stinking terrorists. Why are they terrorists? Huh? They go blowing up stuff. They caught them down Frisco with the bomb. Yeah. Sabotage all the logging equipment. It took up our whole legal team. It took up much of our key organizers. They were taken up in trying to defend Daryl and me and trying to organize support for me in the hospital and trying to help us uh, with the legal work, so it, it really, it took our top leadership out. What did this make you feel with respect to what had happened? It made me feel that this was an act of political sabotage aimed at Redwood Summer as much as anything aimed at me or Daryl. People around me tried to put together our own investigative teams because we felt the bombing wasn't being investigated, and I, of course, had to attend these meetings and discuss in great detail all of these things kind of, you know, dragging it all up. We discussed where did the fake press releases come from and things like that. We just kind of brainstormed to try to uh, figure some of that out. Ultimately, you started this lawsuit, correct? No. Daryl started this lawsuit. I was still too disabled to deal with lawsuits. And... Did you want it to start? Absolutely. 
What was it you hoped to achieve by pursuing the lawsuit? Justice. In what form? Justice and vindication. The other purpose was to try to create some kind of restraint on the FBI so that they couldn't continue to do this to political activists. We've charged them with false arrest, illegal search and seizure, unequal protection of the law, and conspiracy to violate our First Amendment rights by discrediting us as terrorists. And have there been things that you've learned in the course of the lawsuit that have had an effect on you that added on to the impact of the original arrest and the accusations? The discovery that the FBI had held a bomb school in Eureka, California, one month before I was bombed, during which they blew up cars with pipe bombs. In discovery, when Hansen said that there had been this bomb school and that Frank Doyle had been his instructor and that what they had done practically recreated the same crime scene the way I heard it, as soon as we walked out of that deposition, I was terrified. I had panic attacks. I was, I was terrified. Because it raised a question about FBI prior knowledge, and it, it was something deeper than I thought that this was. And I, you know, I began to question: Was there more involvement than I could see? And I wondered whether, um, if I found that out, was I in danger? Is there another thing that you learned that had a similar type of impact on you in the course of the lawsuit? When I first saw the crime scene photos. And it was so obvious that the bomb was not only under the seat, but that it was unambiguous. I, I guess they were busy in Waco or something, and they weren't paying attention. But for some reason, they released to us these incredible photos that absolutely, without a doubt, show that the FBI and the Oakland police lied and knew they were lying. This is the picture right after they've taken me out of the carts. Um, the front seat is blown right through. The back seat is completely intact any idiot would have known that the bomb was under the front seat and meant to kill. Well, my observation of these photos was that the evidence was unambiguous, and so the arrest, based on the claim that they thought that the bomb was in the back seat, must have been deliberate rather than a mistake. And uh, that became clearer in my mind. That's how I felt about it when I saw those photos. And just looking at those photos, looking at myself, being pulled out of the car and stuff. I, I cried the first time I saw them. It took a while to be able to just be hard and do them. And the police report also has some interesting information in them. The first cop on the scene was Oakland Police Department Officer Greeby. And his first statements before anybody else gets there, he says, I am now photographing the car. I'm photographing the damage under the driver's seat. 20 minutes after the bomb went off, Sergeant Sitterud of the Oakland Police Department arrived. He's labeled us as terrorists, and what he says in the warrant is, I viewed the white Subaru along with an agent of the FBI, Frank Doyle. Frank Doyle told me that the bomb was in the backseat floorboard. So as soon as that statement is made, all of a sudden the bomb starts changing position in the reports. Frank Doyle has made the most blatant lie. He says right in there, I base my statement on my observation of a large hole in the backseat floorboard. Well, there's the large hole and it ain't in the backseat floorboard. When I found out that I had cancer and I was getting weaker and weaker, I um, 
announced that I was dropping out of Earth first, right in the middle of the Head Wars campaign, because I didn't have enough energy for both, and I felt that other people could take on the Head Wars work easier than other people could take on the FBI work. Probably the most significant accomplishment so far is Headwaters Forest. Headwaters Forest is 3,000 acres of old growth redwood, 2,000 year old trees. Charles Hurwitz wanted to cut it and Earth First first walked it, mapped it, named it, made an issue out of it, and created the political climate in which a timber harvest plan could be denied. Timber harvest plans had never been denied in such an area before. And just this summer, and I would say because of the pressures of Redwood Summer, the timber harvest plan for, for Headwaters Forest was denied. The ferns on the floor of this forest are six feet tall. The trees are 300 feet. They're 15, 20 feet across. They're 1,500 to 2,000 years old. This isn't just scenery we're talking about. This man is ripping out the lungs of the planet, and no human being has the right to do that. Yeah! Please welcome Judy Berry. Um, the protesters in the North Woods for their opposition to cutting. I want to thank them for bringing this to the attention of the public. They have been marginalized, abused, arrested. It has been for them uh, a very long struggle. In this case, we don't want it all, as Judy Berry once said. We just want what's left. <laughs> and what's left in the Redwood biome is 4% of the one, two million acres. If they could, they would take them all 
How do you feel about the continuing effect of the original accusations against you? I think Rick First continues to be discredited by it, and people on the East Coast, for example, if they know anything about me, I'm that terrorist who blew myself up with my own bomb. Do you still feel the effect of the accusations? In particular, the aspect that, that there's a bomber out there. And it's not just that nobody found him, it's that nobody has ever looked. All right, so we're resuming after the break with the deposition of Judy Berry in Berry versus United States, C91, 1057, CW. We're in the direct examination of Ms. Berry. All counsel are present, and after the break, I have no further questions of the witness. No questions for the federal defendant. No questions for the Oakland defendant. Uh, that concludes then the deposition of Judy uh, Berry yeah. in the above mentioned case. We'll adjourn. Environmentalists are mourning the death of one of their most powerful leaders in Northern California, Judy Berry. She died at a Mendocino home of breast cancer. Those who knew her say she made a difference in their lives and in the environmental movement called Earth First. There was just a, a determination and a focus. Maybe some people might call it uh, almost obsession, uh, but it was definitely she was on the case. She cared, and out of that caring uh, was the source of her power.
It was an emotional day in the courtroom today in the case of Earth First activists Judy Barry and Daryl Cherney versus the FBI and Oakland police. In a videotape recorded a few weeks before her death in 1997 from breast cancer, a tearful Barry testified about the effect on her life of the bombing and the charges against her. People can see when activists are attacked for their activism by the government, by the police, and by the national or federal police, you know, and particularly uh, the FBI part is, you know, should be in bold relief for everyone in the country to understand at a time like this especially. False arrest, you know, false affidavits, you know, the smear campaign, the sham investigation. This case has these extreme facts that don't befall uh, uh, civil cases very often. They've come into court and they've engaged in the exact same smear tactics that they engaged in from the moment the bomb went off. And uh, we've even said that it's given rise to a new rule of evidence, which seems to be that smear say is completely admissible. Judy Barry called for all of our supporters to come here every day. They had a, a aura about them in the room. It was uh, very, very... Uh... I don't know, very earthy, very loving, very nurturing. What the FBI has been doing instead of fighting terrorism is looking at activists and tampering with activists' protected activities, and that's got to stop. And it's got to be the strongest message you can give, especially at this time, to uh, the people in California and around this country that terrorism by our law enforcement agencies can't be allowed no matter whether these people are wearing uniforms or in high positions or not. Being in democracy is not about voting once a year. It's about participating in government all the time. And so when the government, in particular the FBI, does you wrong, it's your responsibility as an American citizen to take them to task, to take them to court if necessary, and hold them accountable. He been taught very strongly, don't mess with firecrackers. If you don't mess with firecrackers, you're going to get hurt. You certainly don't mess with bombs. And furthermore, Daryl, I mean, he wouldn't know what to do with a bomb. The, the bomb was under the seats. We're looking right down. In this area here. Dennis Cunningham was just unbelievable. Bob Bloom got the details down and you know, talked about each lie that they told. He had the chart up with all the seven lies on the search warrant. He went over each one. So he turns around and he says, he just points, he's, he, you're supposed to talk to the jury. He says, Cinnamon lied. And he turns around and says, you lied, didn't you? <laughs> lied twice in his testimony blatantly that he was shown a, that day, May 24th, a bag of finishing nails. There is no bag of finishing nails in this case. So it's not going to be uh, very quick, and that's what they said last week. That could mean it'll spill over the next week. Everywhere were columns and names and, and, and the crimes that they had committed. I feel confident right now. I think that it's clear that the officers had a reasonable basis for what they did, and if the jury follows the instructions as the court has given them, they will find for the defense. Let the jury have the time and space they need to render justice. We're talking two months of trial and another three weeks of deliberation. We took our time. The injury was, was done really to us all really to the First Amendment, to really movement. to the concept of political freedom. Somebody said their voice was stronger like heck it was stronger. How could it be stronger once you know someone blew up half of your body? What's left to say they won't do it again? They weren't caught. And so I, I think they were in danger from that point on. So yeah, they stifled them. So absolutely, they were in violation of First Amendment. <laughs> The federal civil jury took 16 days to decide. Today, awarding Earth First supporters a stunning victory. The jury today found that six of seven law enforcers themselves broke the law, violated civil rights, in essence, framing Cherney and Barry. Now, 12 years later, a jury has awarded Cherney and the late Judy Barry $4.4 million for illegal search and false arrest. I'm glad they didn't give up when they pursued it. And I hope other people that are scared and maybe this will give them the courage to face them. I feel a great relief. I feel a great sadness that Judy is not here to experience this victory. But then I also know that Judy Barry is here in a way. Her spirit has been in this courtroom for this entire time. Word in 
dancing on the ruins of multinational corporations dancing on the ruins of multinational corporations dancing on the ruins of multinational corporations ha 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 I just say it's incredible, isn't it, really? The FBI has come into court and more starkly and more clearly than at any time in this case before is engaged in an active cover-up. The FBI is actively involved in scuttling any possibility of a future prosecution in what remains an unsolved and therefore open attempted murder investigation. It's hard to accept that they would say, well, this has no more use when the, the, the bomber or bombers were never found. This first bomb, which was allegedly constructed by the same individual who put the bomb in Judy Barry's car, this bomb has a lot of evidentiary value. If we can get DNA off this, then we have a DNA identity of who bombed us. If you did find out who the bomber was, what could the implications be? Whoever turns out to be the bomber the federal government and Oakland will have some serious explaining to do about why they were not able to follow the chain of evidence or refuse to and find that person 20 years ago. The question I get asked a lot is, do you think the FBI was involved in the bombing somehow? And I would say they were involved in the bombing right up to the present moment by hiding the identity of the bomber. They're running cover for the bomber and they're doing it right to this moment. There is one thing that I want to say about this case, that this case is not about me, it's not about Daryl, and it's not about Earth First. It's about the right of all activists to work for social change without having to fear repression by the government secret police. Flesh and bone to stop the killing of the trees, to 
Say the ancient ones two thousand years old To stop the hand that thieves With a face in the center of a rifle sight And a kids in harmony by her side With a hand on the wheel of a bombed out car This time somebody's gone too far Judy Berry won't give up the ghosts She stands the final stand Calling out to the people who love life the most Defend your promised land Shut her, shut her up, get her out of our sight She took a heart hit, but she's still alive Oh, thank God it's With her hand on the throttle of a revolution And her kids on the cusp of revolution 